done a couple videos showcasing, you know, what I did after my 400 gallon uh, reef tank exploded. So a little bit about the demographics about myself. So I got into the hobby. I've been in the hobby for about three ish some years. You know, it's been a self-taught process, trial and error. I learned from my own mistakes. Uh, therefore, I would never give a reefer any advice that I have not done. If I haven't done that, I'm going to tell you, hey, you know, I don't know, but let me find somebody that has done it. Therefore, I can give you accurate information because a lot of times we get information based off he said, she said, and that, though that may have worked for that person, it may not work for everybody, you know, just because my alkalinity is 12.6 doesn't mean your alkalinity should be 12.6. I'm only giving guidelines to what I do. If you want your reef to look like mine or you want the growth pattern to look like mine, I mean, mine is not, I've seen super colorful reefs, you know, and I've seen super growth reefs. My reef is in the middle. So I have good growth and I have decent color. Right now I'm on the coloration, coloration program. So I'm trying to color my corals up a little bit. You know, I get my deep blues, my deep reds, my deep oranges, my deep greens, but I'm trying to go for more of that sci-fi look. Like when you look at it with 420, you're just like, wow, I can't believe that's even live. The pigmentation is just crazy. That's just me. I, I won't Photoshop any videos. I won't Photoshop any pictures. No, what's, what's the point, you know? But it never said about that. So... I talked to my friend, man, and he told me, hey, you know, a lot of reefers really want to hear about your 400 gallon crash. They want to hear how you did it and what you did to succeed in this hobby after taking such a devastating hit. So, when I set my 400 gallon up, I let it cycle for about a month, roughly. Uh, I was using ATM Colony, of course, shout out ATM. You know, I don't sponsor them, but that stuff is like gold, man. I mean, every time I've used it, spot on every time. So it's my go-to. So I took what I did for my 400 and I had to tweak it because I had to cut the time down substantially because I still had coral that was in kitty pools that I needed to uh, get into this reef. If you've seen Mang's video when he said, you know, Deirdre's back with a 300 gallon, Honestly, I kind of felt like, you know, I could do better. Like, that that's not the reef that I'm really seeking. But, you know, it was, at the time, it was sustaining and coral were thriving and they were growing, they weren't dying. So, you know, I saw it was a plus one, but the coloration, because of all the shock, just it had me looking at my tank like, wow, you know, I have a lot of work to do. Therefore, I started up my water changes. So instead of doing 10% bi-weekly as I do now, I did 10% twice a week. So I was doing 20% uh, per week, but I would stretch it out four or five days. I was dosing colony. I was using stability. Um, I was maintaining my calcium, alkalinity, magnesium levels. I was testing almost daily for that nitrate and ammonia because I had a couple of fish that did perish away in the system and I didn't want that ammonia to start to kill the rest of the inhabitants. Um, I was counting my fish every day. I mean, even to this day now, I still count them. There's probably about 30 of them in there, but I count them daily because, you know, my fish are like, you know, my children, even though I have a two-year-old daughter. My fish are like my children, so I want to see uh, all my fish. I used to name my fish, but it seemed as though every time, you know, my wife would name a fish or I would name a fish, the fish would die or something would happen to it. I would have to quarantine it or something went strange with it. So now I just go off the original nomenclature of the fish. I know for a fact I have two flamingos, one blonde naso, a fox face, a yellow tank. Uh, I just added a tomini tank and I added a blue jump. The blue dog's been a model citizen. I mean, I only have one cleaner shrimp in here, a cleaner rats, and a fire shrimp. When I see them, they're usually darting across the floor under the rock work because it's a long beak uh, rats 
predatorily, he's supposed to eat those guys. But I keep him fed off PE mice and, you know, my own blend of shrimp, mussels, oysters, uh, raw fish, mm, the tuna blend uh, from the Asian store. And I freeze it. I throw some spiraling power in it and I freeze it. So when I get the blocks out, if I want to go for a heavy feeding, I'll pop a couple blocks out, maybe two or three. It doesn't take much to feed, you know, this system because I'm trying to feed, you know, morning, lunch, dinner. So I don't go for like one big feed and I go for like three smaller feedings in order to uh, make everybody happy and to give everybody a chance to eat. There's one fish that I have to feed by himself, the rare one, uh, my marine beta. He only comes out at night and at between five and six. He'll come out, he'll swim from left to right, and then he'll go back into his hole. That's it. That's the only time that you would see him. A lot of times I rush home from work in order to get a glimpse of him. Pretty neat fish. He's about and eh, probably about six, seven inches. It's beautiful, but it's very, very shy. And marine bathers are normally used to being nocturnal anyway. So that's that. Um, so with the 400 crash, I was testing all the levels. I was making sure everybody was substantial. But one thing that I failed to tell the reapers on the last update video that Mang did, it's all about placement. So. I said that in my first video that I ever did with men. It's not about intensity, it's about placement. Where you place your corals is gonna dignify how they're gonna grow, what space they have to grow. Uh, is there gonna be coral warfare right there? Are they gonna get enough food being in that particular place? So when you look at your tank, you have to know what's a high intensity coral, which is SPS, uh, some LPSs, and what's a low uh, intensity coral, which is like my orange recordias down here, this chalice that I bought for a dollar that I'm gonna bring back to life. I can already see his red rim. He's already coming back. So I give him about a month, he'll be good. No worries. Uh, my lobos are low, even though this lobo is pretty high. Well, moderate to high. My Duncan is moderate to high. My Galaxia is, I put them in high because with Galaxias, if you put them in low flow, they're gonna shrivel up. They're not gonna have that polyp extension that you're actually searching for, that you're looking for. They're gonna look dull, you know? You put them in high flow, they're gonna get the food that's being cycled through the water column. When the fish poop, I watch it and it just goes down, it hits that pump and it blows back out. So. I placed him right there, not to mention, he can sting and kill any coral. So, again, the placement. My SPS rock right here is lit by four decennies within like a, that space is maybe four feet. Just from here to here, it's maybe four feet. But there's four lights right here. These four lights hit this area so there's no shadowing from the left, the right, the back and the center, because right here is a boat of stones. Not to mention these things are controllable in addition to the two radions. So the two radions, this one is on a separate intensity because there are a bunch of stonies over here. And there's mainly softies over here. So this one is actually lower than this one, but you can't really tell if you look at the overall picture. You can't really tell that that intensity is lower for the softies. Just, you know, food for thought. Um, fish and coral placement. So, a lot of times I've had, you know, like my flamingo, he's quite big. So, he needs a space where he can sleep, where he's not going to knock down his coral. So, what I did was I made little holes in all my rock work. So, when I moved the rocks, I purposely left this big open space, big enough I could put a coral right there if I really wanted to, but I'm not going to cover their space because that space allows them to get under the rock work. And behind the rock work, it's braced up uh, with 
some PVC pipe back there, uh, some egg crate is back there, just so the rocks do not move, but it's like hollow. So though it looks like it's coming out at you and it looks like it's big, huge, monstrous piece of rock, mm, they're big and they're tall, but they're also hollow. So behind this whole structure, I can literally probably stick my whole hand and move it around because I actually built the rock work to accommodate the fish back there. So if they want to go to sleep, they can go to sleep back there and be comfortable. Under this, there's actually a huge anemone that I can only see if I scrounge my head through the wall right there and take my phone and film a video of it. There's a huge anemone under this rock work. And it's a, it's a bubble anemone, it's like a rainbow bubble anemone. It's under it. Pretty neat. Um, off to my right side of the tank is my LPS. Though I have a few around, uh, the majority of them are right here because the hammers can coincide with the frog spine, which it can correspond with the octo spine, and yada, yada, yada. They can all go together, they can touch one another, and they won't kill each other. Now, if I move this hammer, say, right here, this hammer can kill these recordias, this chalice, this A can, these GSPs, these Zoas, because the centicles are so long. So I stuck them over here in order to accommodate uh, him being next to his peers. As far as scoring intensity, I'm trying to get this video pretty much a catch all, but feel free to message me with what you want to see and I'll, I'll go into detail about any subject that you want me to go into detail about. Uh, so let's go with SPS. SPS, which is the holy grail of coral, which is the hardest coral that you can possibly heat. And yeah, it's not that hard. Like people make SPS seem like it's just extremely difficult, but it's not. I mean, you just have to know the parameters of the SPS. So, right here, there's a gyre in the back. This gyre goes front to back, it stops, goes back to front. So, there's nothing that's going to sit on these cores and make these cores decay. They're always getting continuous flow 24 hours of a day. Not to mention, they, the return is actually hitting across the SPS. So, when it comes, it makes a nice little swirl towards the top. Not enough swirl to make bubbles, but enough swirl where I'm like, okay, nothing's going to settle on the surface of the water under this plate. Because this big plate that's the center brace in my tank, it's really, really hard to get under to clean it. So if it settles, you know, I literally have to take a magnet, stick a magnet under it, and just go along the top. But this side, right here is probably the most moderate flows, very, very peaceful right here because I did not want to blow the skeletons of these LPS too crazily because you blow them too crazily, they're going to want to detach. When they detach, they're going to kill themselves. Seen it, done it, learn from my mistakes. Uh, this scenario right here, probably a little bit too high for his taste, but overall, he's doing well. In the daytime, he's big. He's big, he's fluffy, he's everything I want a scenario to do, but if I had a choice, I would move him. He was up there, but I had to put this uh, gallon four up there, so I had to move this side area because the gallon four would have covered it in daytime because gallon fours get big and wavy. Um, my Blastos, they're doing so-so. I've noticed between my greens and my pinks, my pinks are sitting at a lot higher, lot lower flow, and they're way more out. So maybe in the coming weeks, I'll actually find a lower spot for this big guy and move him somewhere where he's not going to get blasted too much. But for right now, I mean, he's not to the point where he's going to die. He's he's decent, you know. He's not too not too too much flow, not too less of flow. He's getting enough to actually get its feel. My clam, which was up here, is now down here in the rock work. And though I don't like that place, and I might move him, uh, 
it's all about how I'm going to aquascape my tank. So, it's moving on. So, my torch, my purple torch up here, is sitting in a place where he cannot sting any other coral. So, the purple torch is up here. He's good to go. Because I noticed when I put him anywhere else, he would either sting coral or he would retract away from the coral. Which pretty much sucked because he's a nice color. When I got him, he was like whitish because, you know, my buddy kept him under T5s. Shout out to T5s. I like T5s. But it didn't give the overall intensity. It gave, it gave too much par at the surface level. And which par is good for SPS, but it's not too good for LPS because it bleaches them out. So, if you notice, my lights are very, very high. My lights are 22 inches off the surface of the water. Uh, the reason why I did that is overall spread, and I can run my intensity a lot higher. Any of you radions know, owners know, radions are deceptively bright. So, if I would have went with the manufacturer's recommended nine inches above the water, I would not have gotten the front to back spray that I get now. I'm to the point where I can see down here that the light is actually hitting the front edge of my tank and also the back edge to the point where if I go down into the sump, I can see the light from the other side, which is always good. But Enough of me yapping about tanks. Uh, I would love for you guys to share questions or any kind of concerns or anything that I can do to help. So that was my overall view of my tank. Next video, I'm going to start talking about filtration. Filtration is always good. But filtration is like one of those things where you have to be very, very careful with because you can over uh, filtrate your tank. Believe it or not, you can make your system too clean and corals will die if your system is too clean. But, my name is DeAdrian and thank you for watching.